we're going to talk about power, torque, the PV diagram, the mean effective pressure, and other things. So they're all things that are related. So first we're going to tackle what is what are power and torque and how do they relate to each other. So I'm going through, uh, this is the starting the slide deck lecture number three. Um, so power and, well, as I said, power and torque are highly related. And so power or torque is a measure of sort of how much effort you can expand, so how much work you can do. That is torque. So this is a, a it's a, it's basically like a, you could think of it as a measure of how steep of a hill could you actually climb. Now power is a measure of the rate at which you're doing that, uh, you can deliver that work. And so that tells you for a given hill, how fast you could actually uh, go up that hill. <clears throat> now we want to measure these different parameters um, and see how they relate to each other. And the way we actually measure these is with devices called dynamometers. Um, we're gonna, I'm going to play here. This is a clip from actually a small Malaysian company. And so I'm going to play this clip uh, about a company that makes their own dynamometers. Uh, we produce a wide range of dynamometers. Now, a dynamometer is essentially a piece of equipment to measure the speed, the torque, and the power from an engine. So there's our first answer. So a dynamometer is something that will measure those three basic parameters, the torque output of, in this case, is a vehicle. We'll see the difference. Uh, the torque output, the speed at which that torque is coming out, so the speed at which the vehicle is going as this work is expended, and hence the power. And those three things are related. Hi, uh, I'm Horizon Catano. I'm the, uh, the uh, Chief Technical Officer of Focus Applied Technologies. We are kind of a unique Malaysian technology company in that we design our own control systems, equipment, including a lot of dynamometers and engine control systems right here in Malaysia using Malaysian talents. Um, we're located in Penang and we've been active for uh, just over 10 years. Um, pretty much any dynamometer uh, essentially measures three main things. We're measuring the speed of the speed of the engine or speed of the wheels. We're measuring the torque. And from that, we calculate the power. So maybe one thing that we can think of. So one question that uh, one usually has is where, where is the dynamometer in that picture? And so the answer is what we're looking at here is a motorcycle and the dynamometer is all around it. Actually, it interface with the vehicle. It interfaces with the vehicle at, in this case, at the wheel. So here we have the wheel that is turning in this direction. So that wheel has a certain, I'm just gonna to switch tool, that wheel has a, turns at a certain angular rate of rotation, omega, and it interfaces with, we can see part of a drum here on the bottom that's being driven by, driven by the wheel there. And so that drum is what measures the torque that is being applied. Um, so that measures the, so this drum is the interface of uh, the dynamometer. And so that, so that drum interfaces with the wheel and that is where the torque is being applied. So what's actually measured is the speed of the dyno itself. So this would be the speed of the wheel. Although we know that we know the radius of that, of that drum and we know the radius of the wheel so we can relate both to each other. And we're measuring the torque as it's being applied to, or here we're measuring a force essentially as it's being applied to the surface of that drum. And we're measuring the rate at which that force is being applied. So I'm just going to erase all of my drawings and then we can restart the video. Additionally, the dynamometer can add load. You can add as much load as you want. Now, why do people want a dyno test? Obviously, most people are interested in dyno testing because they want to figure how much power they're making. Because what you see on a dynamometer is you'll get a torque curve. If you've changed components, then you change the torque curve. You change how the, the vehicle performs on the road. The so there's actually an interesting information. So what we get is a torque curve. And the torque curve is essentially, so here we're seeing, I'm going to try to read the pixelated screen. So on the bottom here should be, and this is all torque curves, it should be the RPM, so the rotation speed of the, of the device. And on the top, there's actually probably two curves. So one of them here you can see is power. And on the left is torque. So one of these, actually, I think the red one would relate to 
This is the power of that the vehicle is expanding, let's say at this given RPM. And at this given RPM, here is the torque that I can read here. And these are the torque proofs. That are, those are the characteristics of uh, sort of the of the engine or the, of the in this particular case is of the uh, the power and torque that's ex expanded by the entire vehicle. Okay, I'm going to erase my drawings again. We'll restart this. Torque curve is actually very very important. There are different kinds of torque curves for different kinds of vehicles. So. Uh, dyno testing can be used to determine is your vehicle engine and tuning appropriate for your style of driving or riding, um, and it can also be used to tune in. Well, uh, Mario has asked us to bring a four-wheel drive automotive chassis dyno, and we have worked on a lot of four-wheel drive uh, chassis dynos, and of course we have our own two-wheel drive automotive chassis dyno. If you're interested in seeing what dyno tuning is all about and see some dyno pulls, come out to the Malaysian Auto Show Saba 2019. We'll be there. So that's a first, that's a first introduction to what is a dynamometer. I'm going to move this window out of the way. Here's a second, so from a different company. We have, this one is from, so this is SLP, Street Legal Performance. It's just a different company that uh, is going to give an introduction in this particular video from a few years back, but what is a dyno? And one thing to keep in mind as we're watching this one is that the type of dyno that we saw uh, in this previous video is actually here. I'm gonna bring the window back up. Let me just try to find an example. There we go. So here we see that the dyno is actually measuring the parameters as they come through the wheel. So what we're looking at now, those are the those are wheel parameters. So that is the torque that the engine can give once it's gone through the entire transmission, once it's gone through the wheel. The the radius or the diameter of the wheel is going to influence or is going to change the amount of torque at the wheel and the amount of power that's expanded at the wheel. So I have to take all of these different uh, changes into account. Um, so these are yeah. So these are wheel parameters. Let's just watch this other video here and I'll comment on this as this goes along. A lot of guys like to argue about who makes more horsepower than who and there's a number of different ways to measure your actual horsepower. On the OEM side when we talk about power we're usually talking about SAE engine power and that SAE engine power is measured here at an engine dyno lab. Now on the forums a lot of times we'll see people talk about rear wheel horsepower and there is a difference to us engineers and we're going to explain that to you in this episode but Today, we've been given rare access to our OEM development lab here, and we get a chance to see how that testing is done on even some of our prototype engines. Now, I can't show you everything that's going on in this building, but we have been given a chance to come on inside and see what that testing looks like with proper equipment and proper procedures. So come on inside with me, and we're gonna take a look at one of our engines running a test and doing actual power measurement on the engine dyno first. So we're here today at our engine dyno facility and we're in cell number 28. There's obviously a lot of other cells up and down the row here. You might even hear a couple engines running in the background, but we're running the engine only on the dyno today to find out how the engine behaves without the confusion of the transmission or the vehicle attached to it. So that's an important dist uh, distinction to make. So in this particular case, we are measuring or they are measuring the parameters at the engine directly. So here, let me just annotate here's a, a block diagram. Let me, let's just put a block diagram. Do we have squares? There we go. So let's say this is our engine. There's our, here I'm going to draw it long and skinny. This is our transmission. Let me see if I can draw a circle. The transmission is going to connect to the wheels. Let's draw it here. There we go. So so here's first, oops. So here first is our engine. And the power from the engine connects to the transmission, which connects through the wheel axle. So the previous dyno that we saw actually measured, this was the, the Malaysian, I'm gonna call it the Malaysian dyno, although it's not particular to my late Malaysia, it's just a particular video that we saw. 
it measures the parameters right here. So it measures the torque developed and the power developed at the wheel contact with the rest of the world, with the ground, or in this case, with the dyno. We could, uh, we could attach the trans, we could take off the wheel and then attach a dyno and then measure out here. I could uh, measure the parameters here. Or I could measure the parameters. Okay, I could cut off everything, which is what we're doing in this particular case. I could cut off the transmission and the wheel and measure the parameters at the engine. So parameters at engine. Uh, so these would be engine parameters. And actually we, uh, we talked about brake parameters. So when we talk about the, the, param the, the torque and the power here, we'll put a B, which stands for brake. So this would be the brake torque and the brake power. I'm going to see a bit later. There's a different, uh, there's a different type of measurement. So these are all places where, and they give us different information, right? So if we measure after the transmission, obviously we're including the losses that occur in the transmission. So all of the mechanical losses, uh, mechanical friction, uh, different uh, energy that's lost, so the heating of the of the transmission fluid and so on. So all of the losses that are lost inside the transmission. So we're taking those into account if we measure the parameters after the transmission. Okay, as we clear the drawings, we'll restart the video. So you'll see on our engine here, we actually have a ton of wires coming off of it. We measure everything here at the Engine Dyno Lab, and that gives us more data than we would need. We can always throw that data out, but we can't replace it later. The reason why we collect so much data is that SAE testing procedures call out very specific conditions for the test. So we have to maintain constant temperatures and pressures while we're collecting the data. So by measuring everything, we can ensure that we are indeed following the proper SAE test procedure. And that way, when we get a power measurement, it is a valid measurement. These measurements are done in steady state here on the engine dyno, which is a little bit different than how you see it on the chassis dyno. That's on the engine dyno, we were okay. testing just the engine a moment ago, and what we got out of that was horsepower delivered to the flywheel. So we would actually measure both horsepower and torque right here at the flywheel on the back of the engine. Well, that connects to our transmission right here, and there can be some losses in the transmission, actually quite significant. And in this truck, we actually go a step further down. We have a transfer case because it's a 4x4 system, so turning this takes some additional effort, and we lose a little bit of horsepower here. Moving further down, we get to our prop shaft, and so the prop shaft's got its own bearings, and it feeds the axle and the ring and pinion assembly in here. And finally, what's left after all these guys take their slice of the pie is horsepower that will be available to the tires to accelerate the vehicle. And just to demonstrate this, if we turn this prop shaft here by hand, you can see that the tires are moving, but it takes some amount of energy just for me to move the shaft at all. And if I stop spinning it myself, the friction in the system slows it down to a stop. So in order to keep the vehicle driving down the road, we actually have to make enough energy not only to push it down the road here at the tires, but also overcome all this friction and all these losses in the drivetrain. Now we're here at the chassis dyno. Now this looks a little bit more familiar to everybody in the aftermarket. You guys are used to seeing power numbers that typically come from this. And the power that we're measuring here is actually power at the wheels or at the tires. So the tires are actually gonna turn these drums right here. And the amount of force put into these drums times the speed of the drum gives us a calculation for horsepower. But we have to remember what we saw earlier. All that OEM level testing, when we rate engine power, is typically measured at the engine dyno for accuracy. And we have all those power robbing thieves in between, the transmission and the drive line, that each take a little slice of our total engine power and leave us with a little bit less tractive effort at the tires. And this is going to measure what's left at the tires. Now, it's important to you as a customer because that's what you actually get to use to push your car or truck down the road. So when we at SLP are doing development, you'll often see us quote power numbers at the tire in addition to an engine rated power. Okay, let me just come back a little bit here because we had a view of we have a view of the dyno. Where is this? See a video. I'm just trying to get a better view of up. Oh, I think this is. I think we almost have it. 
There we go. So here's a view of uh, the dyno it's, or the engine mounted on the dyno. So I'm going to draw the engine in red, which should be this whole this whole package over here. So my pistons are, it's sort of obscured because I have all of this wiring that is looking at the timing and everything and the, the firing and all that, any, any sort of parameters and the pressures and the, uh, the positions of the cranks and so on. But my engine is in here. And then the output shaft of the engine connects to, so the output shaft of the engine connects to this device over here, which that is, that is actually the dyno itself. So, excuse me. So what this is measuring is it's measuring the speed at which this shaft is rotating, omega, and then it, um, so omega, this is d theta dt. So it is measuring the speed at which this is rotating and it's measuring the force. You can think of it as there's different types of dynos. You have magnetic clutches if you have uh, uh, some that operate with a liquid that is basically being turned by an impeller, sort of like a turbine. Uh, so there's different types of, um, there's different types of, uh, of dynos. Um, but essentially what we're doing is that there's, there's a, a I'm gonna draw these. You can think of it as there are sort of brake pads so the engine is connected to a spinning rotor. Sorry, I'm just printing it. There we go. So the engine shaft connects to a spinning, you can think of it as a, a spinning disc, a rotor, and that turns with the engine. And then we have brake pads that are come and apply a force to this rotor. So these brake pads would come in hence the name brake parameters. So they would come in and what we're measuring is the friction force. So those brake pads are gonna come in and apply a friction force. So the, the rotor is gonna to try to turn these brake pads and then we could attach just a big, you can think of it as a big mechanical arm with a weight at the end, like this. And now this, this weight is telling me so, so essentially how much force how much force I am uh, we are imparting onto uh, onto those stators. So here are another ways you can think of this is the rotor. So here's the rotor is going to be turning let's say in this direction. The engine is turning the rotor at omega, and then I could attach a mass at the end of a rope. And so as the engine works, it's, it's winding up this mass. And if I, if I increase the amount of mass on there, so if I put a, a heavier mass, then the engine for the same, well, the engine will turn at a different speed and the mass will come up at a different rate. There we go. So my rotor has a certain diameter R. So I could say, well, what's the torque that is being applied? So that the torque is the force that is being applied at this point. So the torque is the force applied at the surface of the rotor. So it's a force times uh, a length, which in this case is going to be the force applied is the, is the weight mg of the mass that's suspended multiplied by the distance from the center multiplied by r, the radius. Now the power, the power that is being imparted to this spinning wheel is let's see so power is a force times a velocity so all of that power uh, all of that power is transmitted to the mass it's basically uh, the the weight well it's the power that's done on the mass to raise it so it's going to be the weight the weight of the mass as it's raising this is we said the weight of the mass is mg and the mass is moving up at a certain velocity u and now what is that velocity well that velocity is the speed it's the the sort of the, the velocity at which the contact point on the side of the wheel is moving up, which that is omega r, like that, omega r. So if I just turn the omega r around, this is mg r times omega, and this mg r, that is my torque, as we've seen over here. So the power is equal to the torque time the rotational speed. There we go. That my definition is what the torque. Uh, well, that is the relation, the relationship between the power and the torque. So if I know how much torque an engine can deliver at a given rotational speed, then I know automatically at that rotational speed how much power is being delivered. Um, 
I'm going to go back to, let me go back to our slide. I'm going to clear all our, clear all of our drawings. I'm going to take my video away. There we go. So now we can go back to the slides and here we have the same explanation. So uh, again, this would be like a, a sort of a pad driven um, or a pad uh, a type of, uh, of dyno. And so in this particular case, so the rotor is turning and then we have these pads and it's, uh, this is how we actually apply the load. So it's actually forcing against a mechanical device here, which would be a load, uh, a load cell or force transducer that would actually give us a measurement of the force a certain distance away from the rotor. So knowing that distance B, then I know how much torque the rotor is imparting on, um, how much torque the, the rotor is imparting on the standard part of the dyno. And if I know the speed at which that rotor is turning, then I know the power as well. So here we have the same equation we just derived. The power is equal to rotational speed times the torque. And there's a slight conversion. So I just like to, I'm just going to make a note. So I like to always, always, always carry out units. So in this particular case, omega would be in units of radians per second. And torque can be anything you want. So if it's in joules, then joules times radian per second. This gives us... What is this now? Joules per second. This would be a power in watts. And if I measure the, uh, this would be a, this would be a torque in joules or a joule is a Newton meter. That's a typical unit of, uh, unit of torque that we use. So we just have to be careful here. This is the, um, so we just have to be careful here. If we measure the rotational speed in RPM revolutions, uh, per minute, for example, or in this case is revolutions per second, then I have to have a factor of two pi, which is the number of radians per revolution. So actually what tells us, what this tells us is that the torque is actually an amount of, it's an amount of work, right? Because power is, this is work per time. This is angle, or this is a radian per time. So the torque is an amount of work done per radian. So a torque is actually a measure, it's a measure of work. It's how much work is done by, in this case, by if we're measuring at the engine, how much torque is done by the engine as it's turning by just one radian. Yeah, interesting. We're gonna connect this in the next video. We're gonna con connect this to uh, our PV diagram. Um, let's see. Okay. I'm going to just clear all of my drawings. So here's a small, uh, not a riddle, but a small piece of poetry to remember. Uh, we like to measure, to remember a conversion factor. We like to measure sort of, uh, uh, customary in the industry to an in industry to calculate power and horsepower. Uh, and so in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. So most people should remember when Columbus came over, uh, divide that son of a gun by two. So 1492 divided by two, and that's a number of a Watts and a horsepower too. So 1492 divided by two, gives you 735 or 745.7, uh, roughly the number of Watts in a horsepower. Okay. So here we have a, um, here we have an example. I'm going to annotate. So the question is, so given a single cylinder, four stroke so this is a single cylinder four stroke uh, engine with a displacement volume is 2.8 liters uh, a bore of 86 meter millimeters hold on this is 8.6 centimeters so this is 0 0.086 meters and a stroke of 76 millimeters 0 0.076 meters and a compression ratio of 8.5 and peak power or rated power at 1400 RPM is 86 kilowatts. So this is actually a point on our torque curve. So this is one thing that was uh, talked about in the videos. So we have the torque curve in terms of RPM. So let's say a thousand, two, three, four, five, 48 would be around here. So it's saying that at 4,800 RPM, the power is here. Let's see, power. 
So our power value is 86 kilowatts. Here I'm going to put a second y axis for the torque. So this piece, this piece of information here is a single point on our torque curve. Actually, your, your, your torque curve probably looks. So this is the peak, and then it has to come back down like that. It probably looks a bit like this. There we go. So this would be your power curve, and it's customary to give a single number, which is the highest power you have. But for that information to mean anything, you need to know at what RPM this is going. In this case, we're told it's 4,800 RPM. So calculate the mean piston speed. And now the mean piston speed, it has to be at a certain RPM. So implied in here is the mean piston speed at this 4,800 RPM. And then calculate the torque and the specific power. I'm going to skip the specific power. This is just calculating a particular uh, parameter, which is described at the end of this, um, which is described at the end of this deck of slides. So let's see. So the mean piston speed, well, we know the uh, we know the stroke is 76 millimeters. So the mean piston speed is going to be 2L over the amount of time it takes to go over this uh, one rotation. So it's going to be 2 times 0 0.076 meters divided by how long does it take to go one rotation? Well, we're doing 4,800 rotations per minute. So one divided by 4,800 is the number of rotations, is the number of minutes per rotation. I'm going to multiply this by 60 to have the number of seconds per, this is seconds per minutes. This is minutes per, uh, sorry, rev per minute. And this is meters per two times 0 0.070, this is number of meters per rev. And just erase this unit over there. Okay, so let's measure that. This is, I'm just gonna punch this in, two times 0 0.076. So in one revolution, the, the, the piston moves 15.2 centimeters, which makes sense. And then it's going to be divided by 60 over 4,800. This gives us 12.16. 12.16 meters per second, meters per revs, revs per minute, seconds per minute. This is seconds per rev. This is meters per second. Uh, what is the torque? Well, we said that the power is equal to the torque times omega. So what is we want the torque? So the torque is equal to power over omega. It's going to be 86 kilowatts divided by, now omega has to be in radians per second. So we're doing 4,800 revolutions in one minute, which is 60 seconds. So 4,800 divided by 60 is gonna be revolutions per second. And one revolutions is two pi radian. We're doing two pi radians per revolution. And now this gives us, let's see, Revs, revs, so kilowatts divided by radians. But this is going to be kilowatts times seconds. It's going to be kilojoules divided by radians. So it's the amount of work per, not per angle, but work per, yeah, work per angle, work per one radian of angle. So let's compute this. This is 86 kilowatts divided by 4,800 divided by 2 divided by pi. Multiply by 60. This gives us 0 0.171 kilojoules. And a joule is a Newton meter. So let me multiply by, let me multiply by a thousand. This gives us 171 Newton meters. Which this is a reasonable number. So torque in terms of in Newton meters is like 100 to 100 ballpark right obviously if you have a, a well we'll do another uh, we'll do another example in uh, in a minute there um to get a better uh, or to get another data point as to what uh what torque is like so now i could report so we had this single data point on our torque curve 
or on our power curve. And now I can say, well, that corresponds to a point over here of 171. This is in Newton meters. This is a single point on our torque curve. Uh, and now it turns out actually that the maximum of the torque actually actually usually peaks a little bit below uh, below the maximum. Uh, so it usually peaks at a slightly lower RPM than uh, power. Let's do another quick example, or let's look at another, um, yeah, another quick example of relating torque to power. Let me clear all of the drawings. Let's bring another example, which is actually, um, I'm just looking for a window. There we go. So here's another example of a car. So uh, let's go to Maserati. Ah. There's no bad car. Um, let's see, not pre-owned. What model do we want? So let's look at the GT convertible. There we go. So here's the Gran Turismo convertible. And what I want is the specifications of the engine. So we have a whole lot of information and videos, but I'm an engineer, I want data. Hidden here, full specifications. Let's click this. So length of the car, width, real base, so on. Oh, information about the tires. So this information here will actually tell me uh, the size of the tires. And here's the engine specification. So we have the displacement. This is a V8. And oh, here we have the maximum power and the maximum torque. Interesting. But we're not told at what RPM the maximum power actually occurs. But we have here um, an expression. It says max torque, maximum torque. Uh, often you'll see MBT, maximum brake torque. Same thing. So in this particular case, it's 384 foot pounds. And it is at 4,750 RPM. Ah, interesting. Um, let's see. OK, well, let's go here. I'm just going to put this window off to the side. So let's see what is the power that is uh, that accompanies this uh, this particular torque. Open the annotation tool so I can write. Oh, clear the previous drawings. So now we're not following this problem statement, even though this 4,800 RPM is close. Uh, let's see. So I want the maximum. So I have the torque. Let me put TB, the brake torque, is. 384 foot pounds, pound feet, which is equal to, hold on, let's uh, let's convert this. Um, one, let's say it's 3.28 feet in one meter. Uh, and what do we have? One pound is, let's see, well, I know 2.2 pounds is equal to one kilogram. Yeah, kilograms are 2.2 pounds. So it's one kilogram and one kilogram times G corresponds to 9.81 Newtons. Okay, let's just convert this. This is 384 foot pounds. I'm just gonna erase my equal sign, my equal sign. Uh, and I want to convert, so I'm going to divide this by 2.2 uh, pounds. Nope. Sorry, I'm doing it wrong. Here, let me just rewrite this conversion. So this is um, one pound is equal to what's 9.81 divided by 2.2 is equal to 4.4 four, five, nine Newton per pound. So let's multiply this by 4.459 Newton per pound. And I want to convert the feet. I'm going to divide by 3.28 feet per meter. Okay, so pounds are gonna go with pounds. Feet are gonna go with feet. I'm gonna have this in Newton meters. 
So this is 384 multiplied by 4.459 divided by 3.28. 522.03 Newton meters. There we go. So it's higher, but this still makes this still makes sense. 170 Newton meters. This is sort of your your. Uh, this is a more everyday car. 522 Newton meters. That's a yeah supercar. Okay, which is what this is. All right. So now we know that the power. So this will be the brake power is equal to TB multiplied by the torque times omega. So this will be 522.03 Newton meters multiplied by the rotational speed. Now we have it, it's 4,750 RPM. So 4750 revolutions per minute, which is 60 seconds. Uh, this is the number of Newton meters, the torque per radians, and one revolutions is two pi radians per revolution, right? We said torque is work per, it really means work per radian. So it means that our brake power is going to be equal to our 522.03 multiplied by 4750 divided by 60 times two times pi. Huge number, 259667.19. This is Newton meters. This is a joule per second. This is a watt. Yeah, this is a really big number. This is saying it's 259.7 kilowatts. Uh, Hold on, what's a kilo? Is that a big number or is that a small number? I never know. What's a kilowatt? We said uh, Columbus sailed the ocean blue in 1492. Uh, divide that son of a gun by two. So 1492 divided by two is equal to 746. It's about 746. And that's the number of Newton... No, that's the number of watts in a horsepower too. That's watt per horsepower. Oh, now I can't even, this is bad. Now I can't even remember my little riddle. Let me just go and cheat a little. One horsepower is 745. Yeah, watts, okay, watts per horsepower, okay. Get the oh, where are my engine specs? They were here. Okay. All right. So seven hundred and forty-six. Oops. Watts per horsepower. This is zero point seven four six kilowatts per horsepower. So I take my so my brake power is equal to. Brake power is equal to 259.7 kilowatts divided by 0 0.746 kilowatts per horsepower. These are going to go away. It's going to be a horsepower. It's 259.7 divided by 0 0.746. 348.12 horsepower. And this makes sense. Look, the max power is 454 horsepower. And I mentioned this before during the video, so your torque curves or your torque and power curves, so this is RPM, and we'll have here, I'm gonna draw two axes. One of them is power, one of them is torque. Um, so your torque curve actually sort of overall looks like this. So you have a maximum torque at a given uh, horsepower or at a given RPM, and then your maximum, so this would be the torque curve, and then your power curve would look like that. And it would peak at a higher RPM. This would be power. So this makes sense. I expect that at the max torque condition at 4,750 RPM, 
I would get a power that is less than the maximum power that one would get. I don't see it on this particular web page, but normally I would expect a manufacturer to also tell me at which RPM I get the maximum power. And then I could do the opposite conversion to actually get two points. So right now we had, so we had this particular point here, which allows us to find this particular point there. And usually this point here is also given, which would allow us to find another point over here on the torque curve. Um, one last, oh, here, I'm just going to clear all the drawings now. So one last point I would like to go over. I'm going to go back to the slide, get rid of Maserati. So one last point I wanted to cover is a bit of a naming, uh, uh, naming convention. So the engine, you can, uh, let's think of, so right now I, I'd separated, during the video, I separated the, our device uh, into, I, I drew this block diagram to separate our vehicle into different devices. We had the engine, which was feeding power. So we had the engine, which would connect to the transmission. This is the transmission which would connect to the wheels. And when we measure with a dyno right over here, we talk about brake parameters. Parameters, so brake torque and brake power. If we measure way at the end, we're talking about wheel parameter, this is was referred to as uh, the device that does these measurements, was referred to as a chassis, a chassis dyno, where you could measure over here to get also the amount of losses inside the transmission. Well, I can look inside the engine as well. So if I were to measure, um, let's see, if I were to disconnect metaphorically there, I would still have to drive them because you can't run an engine without a fuel pump and everything. But if I were to disconnect all of the belts on the engine and actually run uh, the coolant and the fuel pump, uh, the injector, uh, and if I were to run the, the even the, the crankshaft, for example, if I had a way to keep the timing uh, uh, perfectly okay so that the, the valves actually open at the right time. But if I ran all of this off of a separate power source, so I have some electric motor that runs these, and I measured, instead of measuring at the output shaft, if I measured straight at, basically straight at the crankshaft, then I would be very close, uh, but not quite there to measuring what we call the indicated parameters. So out here, we measure what we call the brake parameters. And if we measure directly at the crankshaft, what I would get is the amount of torque and the amount of power that the engine gives me without all of these losses here. These are losses. So this is what we would call the, well, it's actually it's almost the indicated parameters. There's still a little bit more losses because inside the crank arm, there's a bearing right here between the connecting rod and the crank arm. There's another bearing which, which has actual friction losses. And out here, there's another bearing which is gonna have uh, generate friction losses. And on the wall there, I have these piston rings and I have the oil rings that are gonna scrape the side of the cylinder. So there's losses over there as well. So if I could, somehow insert a magic device right on um, right on the piston surface. So if I were to measure here, then I would get what we call the indicated parameters. Well, I don't have that magic device, but there actually is a way to do this. And so what I'm interested in is, so the indicated, sorry, um, measured here, this would be the indicated parameters. And that would tell me actually exactly the thermodynamic uh, work and power extraction that I get from my cycle. In fact, there's a way to do this. What we do is we put a pressure transducer or a pressure gauge, or I'm going to abbreviate it. XDCR, you'll see this transducer. So I put a pressure transducer to give me the pressure in the cycle as a function of 
um, as a function of the um, as a function of time. And then I'm going to measure the position of the piston, which actually the, the way I do this is I actually measure the position of the crankshaft to time the cycle. And then I can just geometrically relate the position of the of the crankshaft as it's turning around. I can relate that to the position of the piston. And knowing the position of the piston, I can relate that to the volume. So I could measure theta, the position of the crankshaft. And then I can draw, this is V of theta, the volume is a function of theta, and here's pressure. And then we could get the PV diagram. So I'll have the compression, combustion, expansion, open the valves, and I'm going to push out, draw back in, and then go back up like this. Now this would be a quick sketch of an actual, this would be a quick sketch of an actual, uh, an actual PV diagram, so not an idealized PV diagram. In fact, this is what we're going to do for project two is we're going to compute this shape. Now from thermodynamics, we know that the work done by a fluid in my system, which in this particular case is the fluid inside my cylinder, is equal to the integral of PDV. In this case, through I'm going to put the little circle to say through a cycle. So if I start from any point and I go once around, and I do that, so the integral of PDV, we know this is the integral inside the closed loop. So basically this area there, that is the work done throughout one cycle. And so if I can get, if I can get a torque and a power coming from this PV diagram, then those are what we call the indicated indicated uh, properties or parameters so this would be ti and pi the indicated torque and the indicated power 